Thanks for that, Chris. Um, there were several lunarchic events this weekend. Um, we had a wonderful uh, polyphony here in this room over the weekend. Um, but, uh, well, what about all these royal events? Because wherever royalty is, lunarchy is not far away. There's this royal baby. Well, the one thing that's the job description of royalty, kings, is to align heaven and earth, uh, cosmic alignment. And, you know, the royal baby, lovely, but uh, baby at dark moon? There's a little bit iffy there and room for improvement next time. <laughs> but in Thailand, meanwhile, there was absolutely nothing left to chance. All the court astrologers, all the Buddhist monks were you know, perusing exactly the moment, the transition from waning to waxing moon, when the new king of Thailand would be installed and consecrated. And for that moment, there had to be fired antique cannons, providing the noise, and he had to be washed with sacred water. Now, by the end of this talk, you will have a pretty clear idea of what that sacred water is, and it's an awful lot older than those Buddhist monks, I'm promising you. But I'm going to focus, rather than Lunarchy in the Kingdom of Thailand, Lunarchy in the Kingdom of England, Merry Old England, and the key word is Merry. There is more life and reality in the first act of the Merry Wives of Windsor than in all German literature, <laughs> wrote Frederick Engels to Karl Marx on December the 10th of 1873. Uh, uh, Engels um, always had an unerring instinct for sexual communism wherever it lurked. Um, communism in general, but sexual communism in particular. Shakespeare's play has a great deal of fun with pompous husbands um, who are endeavouring to assert their proprietorial marital rights over their wives. But structurally, this drama, this play, um, is celebrating women's collective uh, carnival, uh, uh, their, their car carnival freedom and it focuses ritually potent laughter, riot, rituals of license, subversion of the established order, which is called misrule by the powers that be. Comedy, in the formal dramatic sense, um, has its roots in popular uprising, in ritual, ritual action that is, that is coming from really below, but especially this is the female, um, female uprising. So my hero's this mysterious figure of Falstaff, who's one of the great original creations of English literature, a demiurge leader of the riot. And no matter how ridiculous he seems, he's also numinous. He's tinged with the divine. His appetites are awe-inspiring for food, for drink, for sex, wine, fair hot wenches in flame-coloured taffeta. His dedication to the pleasures of the flesh is religious. He is himself called a hill of flesh, so described by a royal wannabe. And he's also called the meat, the sweet beef that people eat. So I'm casting Falstaff in the role of a lunar trickster, and I'll bring out salient characteristics that conform to a very ancient kind of trickster, uh, one that the Khoisan hunter-gatherers would recognize. But that's not all there is to Falstaff. He's a protean being who's always changing shape, and he has a whole history of state power and kingship behind him. Some literary critics who had a smattering of Fraserian, James Fraser, um, anthropology, uh, under, having read parts of the abridged version of The Golden Bough, perhaps, have already discussed him, Falstaff, as uh, in terms of divine kingship, seeing his role in the Henry IV chronicle plays uh, as a mock king or interrex. Obviously, in these plays, he's defined in terms of his relationship to royalty. The ritual sequences, and they are sequences which are mimicking 
ritual in the Henry IV Chronicles uh, are enacted between Falstaff and Prince Hal uh, on fields of combat, on battlefields. And they allude to mock battles of kingship, which are, would be found in anthropology of kingship in the Nua or the Shilluk in Africa or further afield in India. Um, there is an example, for instance, in a speech by Bardolf, uh, Falstaff's henchman, uh, about the Gads Hill robbery when they fake um, blood flow by pushing, they fake being wounded and covered in blood by pushing spear grass up their nostrils, up their noses. And this is precisely recalling uh, male initiation rituals of the kind that we know from Papua New Guinea, male menstruation rituals, but it is closer to home found in English folklore in the um, narratives of Jack and the Beanstalk, which may be some male initiation of a similar kind. So in The Merry Wives, by contrast, whereas in the Chronicle plays we have Falstaff in relation to Prince Hal, the emerging wannabe um, monarch, in The Merry Wives, the ritual sequences are all occurring between Falstaff and the women, who are the merry wives themselves. But even there, he's occupying territory of royalty as a kind of native genius of the English kingdom. In apparent contradiction to that exalted status, Falstaff of the merry wives is also both a cuckholder and he's a cuckold. He flips from one to the other very easily with no clear distinction. And he's both a wild huntsman and the hunted beast. Now, the logic of lunacy, which I'm going to demonstrate in a moment, the logic of lunacy, or the sex strike, as um, Chris has called it before, says that, tells us why there should be no distinction between these opposite, apparently opposite roles. In keeping with Falstaff's lunar character, the only thing that's constant about him is his ability to metamorphose. Um, now, we know that these are, let me just show you, sheer lunacy. Um, these are different ways of expressing the same thing, ritual power. So for anybody who hasn't actually been before, let's just run through what is sheer lunacy or the sex strike and the ritual syntax. Um, the original sex strike model was outlined by Chris in Blood Relations, arguing human culture was born in a revolution when women went on strike. Women would um, ally with their kin, their sons and brothers, their blood relations. They would celebrate ritually at the dark of the moon. Um, and as the moon, and, and they would celebrate with the signal of menstrual blood, whether that was real or fake, cosmetic or actual blood, as the moon waxed um, and the night sky would get brighter, particularly at this, this phase, um, men would then go hunting for large game. And they would bring back kills to their wives' camp in time for the full moon, which would then be the time for feasting, the relax of the cooking of the meal, the relaxation of all the taboos that had obtained through that phase. Um, so that would be waning moon, no taboos, until the women came back to the dark moon and go on sex strike again. So this syntax oscillates between the waxing ritual phase, the waning phase, the raw versus the cooked, blood versus fire, kinship versus marriage. And this syntax persists at the core of all magical fairy tales, folklore, and ritually derived narrative dramas, which uh, Falstaff comedies and the other comedy I'm going to address as well, Lysistrata, they, they both are. Okay, um, so we know, you know that this syntax, what, what is extraordinary about this syntax is that it, it, it gets preserved in this very high culture, these very elaborate literary creations. Um, it's a syntax deriving from hundreds of thousands of years ago of the original symbolic structures of human culture, and yet it's still preserved 
in, it's still preserved to this day in Hollywood films, never mind um, Shakespeare and Aristophanes. Um, and the level of fidelity is really impressive. It's stretching over thousands of years. So I'm going to start with the Elizabethan comedy, which was produced by Shakespeare's company in 1597, it's believed, for a specific occasion of royal ritual on St. George's Day. Um, and I'm going to reflect it back onto ancient Greek comedy from 5th century BC, um, which uh, coming from Athens, the Dionysiac festivals of um, Attic Greece. And that is where comedy, actually the idea, the word, um, the dramatic form comes from. Using Aristophanes' Lysistrata, um, which is the comedy of the sex strike, as a template, I can show very, sh very close parallels between Lysistrata and the Merry Wives. Both of them are comedies of women in subversive action. The Merry Wives is remarkable because women win all the way down the line. They organise everything, they pull wool over the men's eyes, they remain merry, honest, full of laughter. Um, but I'm also going to project the drama forward about 300 years to the Italian operatic version, um, Verdi's Full Stuff from 1893, so it's almost exactly 300 years later, which was set to a libretto by Arrigo Boito. Um, now, Levi Strauss says that uh, every retelling of any myth is equally valid, but the Boito Full Stuff is actually the most consummate version. Um, his libretto is quite sparkling. It's very short. It's very pared down, whereas Shakespeare's Merry Wives is rather a bit lacklustre and a bit wordy, we could say. Um, Boito fleshes out the full stuff, where the Merry Wives full stuff is really quite a stock buffoon figure. Um, and Boito, what Boito does is he brings the speeches, the very poignant speeches, which are found in the chronicle plays, Henry IV, part one and two, as well as some of Henry V, and he melds them onto the plot of Merry Wives. That gives his full stuff this powerful presence. And he crystallizes out this ritual structure um, very clear, very precisely, extraordinarily. Um, pairing away everything that's inessential for the character or the episodes and really revealing the dark and the light in the syntax. And then combined with Verdi's music, uh, they both knew it was absolutely magical, um, devilish, Boito called it. Touch it and it burns, he said. Devilry then returning to a Mediterranean Dionysiac source. Shakespeare's sources are, are um, debated they're variegated and they fuse together thanks to this ritual syntax. They all of them borrow from the syntax, but the sources include sort of highbrow classical sources that an educated person in the Elizabethan court would have known, like Ovid's Metamorphoses, um, Greek mythology of Acteon, the, the hunter with, um, who gets turned into the stag, um, Jove or Zeus and Europa, now, I was giving the talk about uh, Zeus and Io uh, a few weeks ago. Um, the story of Zeus and Europe is almost exactly identical. It's just a recapitulation of the girl turning into the cow and being, car and being carried off, or, or the god turning into the bull and carrying her away. Um, and then we get this local Windsor legend of Hearn the Hunter as central um, in, in the story, in the play. Um, and the figure, that, that is the figure that Falstaff gets disguised at in the last act. Um, but also very important amongst the English sources are the Mummers plays, which were seasonal ritual folk dramas, particularly played at Christmas time. Um, these are rituals of license, they're feasts of fools, when the rustic revellers get at their betters of the church and the aristocracy. They're a pretty close equivalent of the ancient Athenian komoi, which were rude choruses of Dionysiac revellers who were taking the piss of the Athenian aristocracy with all kinds of horseplay, cross-dressing, wrong sex, wrong species, ritual masquerade. And that is the original root for comedy, these komoi. So the mummers plays, 
stand in the same relation to Shakespeare's comedy as the old komoi of the 6th and 7th century of Attic Greece to Aristophanes' very polished classical comedy. There are also Italianate sources and Tuscan stories that Shakespeare used to get a lot out of, people like Boccaccio, Fiorentino, um, and of course Boito in doing the, Ver the Verdi opera, he was drawing on those a lot. In fact, he infused the, his plot with those. So I've said Falstaff of the Merry Wives is somewhat a stock figure. He's the butt of all the jokes. Um, he's not really interesting unless we know the Falstaff of Henry the Fourth, Part One and Two. But at the level I'm discussing, which is the ritual episodes and allusion to ritual, there is actually quite a lot of overlap between the Falstaff of Chronicle plays and the Falstaff of the Windsor play. Um, and this especially comes out in this aspect of the lunar trickster. Cunning, wiliness, amoral and irrepressible trickery. These are the chief characteristics of Henry IV Falstaff, who lives on his wits and the ill-gotten gains of his cut purse cronies. For all the low-life sleaze of the Boar's Head Tavern, he's the instructor and sage teacher of the prince. His very first scene with Hal in Henry IV Part I establishes lunar time and tide as the governing rhythm. We that take purses go by the moon and the seven stars and not by Phoebus. Sweet wag, when thou art king, let not us that are squires of the night's body be called thieves of the day's beauty. Let us be Diana's foresters, gentlemen of the shade, minions of the moon, and let men say we be men of good government being governed as the sea is by our noble and chaste mistress, the moon, under whose countenance we steal. And Prince Hal echoes this um, as a kind of almost antiphonal religious chant. The fortune of us that are the moon's men doth ebb and flow like the sea being governed as the sea is by the moon. The death of Falstaff which is not, Falstaff doesn't appear in Henry V, but his death is reported in, in one of the most poignant speeches. Um, and that death is also tidal, even just between 12 and 1, even at the turning of a tide. So this notion of ebbing and flowing, waxing and waning, underlies the imagery of Falstaff's huge size. For all his solidity, Falstaff fears he may dissolve and melt away like butter or grease. He's referred to as tallow. His followers live upon his substance and threaten to eat him up. He's referred to as meat. There seems to be anxiety about lean times ahead. When Prince Hal's teasing, here comes lean Jack, here comes barebone, and asks, how long's it go, Jack, since thou sawest thine own knee? Falstaff says, my own knee? When I was about thy years, how I was not an eagle's talon in the waist. I could have crept into any alderman's thumb ring. A plague of sighing and grief, it blows a man up like a bladder. And they're talking uh, uh, this exchange just as Falstaff is about to introduce news of rebellion and rottenness in the body politic, the kingdom. So growth and decay, cyclical logic of swelling and fading are characteristics of trickster law all over the world. Um, but to think of Khoisan tricksters, particularly the Nama folk hero called Haitsi Aibib, starts off in one story as a very small child, a baby on his mother's back, and he starts growing and growing huge. And then when he's really big, he takes advantage of his size to rape her, his mother, and then reverts back to his original size. This is a story which the um, philologist Theophilus Hahn, who, who was recording Nama folklore, identified as describing phases of the lunar cycle rather than sort of take a sort of moral tone with it. He was understanding it in that sort of oscillation. Now, in the southern San um, Bushman concept of lunar phases, 
the new moon would be addressed with prayers to bring luck to the hunt. But the moon, as it grew big, became a figure of fun. Um, it, it was understood as an enlarging stomach. Falstaff's stomach is just such a subject of ridicule. Yet we know that for the, um, the Khoisan, the Bushman, fatness has a sacred aspect of potency. It's not fanciful to think of Falstaff's fat in the same terms as the fat of the Eland bull, the most sacred animal of the San cosmos. When he appears in his stag's horns at the end of The Merry Wives, he says, I am here a Windsor stag and the fattest, I think, in the forest. He threatens to piss his tallow, which is doubtless a, an obscene double entendre, but it's, it's supposed to refer to the way that stags waste away during the rutting season. And that's a lunar logic. They should get as fat as possible, and then they get thinner and thinner as they're having lots of sex during the mating season. They're sort of being consumed by sex. Falstaff's also called an ox, a town bull, a boar. He mocks himself. I do here walk before thee like a sow that hath overwhelmed all her litter but one, meaning his little page who's following after him like a piglet. Falstaff conforms to wrong sex, wrong species logic. His fatness has a female connotation. At one point of Henry IV, part two, he calls his stomach a womb with a ritualistic repetition. My womb, my womb, my womb undoes me. And that's something that motif traces into the mama's plays, the full swoon I'll come back to. In the opera, Boito has a great play of this thinness, fatness opposition. In one of the very first arias, he brings in a section of that womb speech from the chronicle plays. Falstaff addresses his subjects, Bardolf and Pistol. You're eating up my substance. If Falstaff ever got thin, he wouldn't be himself. Nobody would love him. In this great abdomen are the thousand tongues that proclaim my name. This is my kingdom. I'll make it greater. The moon is surprisingly absent from the text of Merry Wives, but of course the whole scene of the last scene is, is dedicated for moonshine revelry. And the moon's so much part of the scenery, it's hardly necessary to, to refer to it really. A boito in the opera uses lunar themes all the way through the libretto very, very deliberately. Um, and he's drawing on old Tuscan proverbs about the reviving powers of the moon. Of, so it's dying and coming back to life again. So I'm going to try and expound the plot of Merry Wives as with showing its lunar menstrual logic. I'm concentrating on the ritual structure, just boiling it down like Boito did, leaving aside sort of incidental scenes, um, which, which sort of just filling out the, the action. Um, and basically, the ritual structure means the dealings between Falstaff and the women, which gives the ritual action the core of the comedy. There are two spheres of action, the men's and the women's, and until the end of the play, they're not united. The scheming and machination among the men, who are a motley crew with no real interests in common, is fraudulent, deceptive, cheating on each other, competitive. The only thing that tenuously unites them is their gripes against full stuff. The women, by contrast, are genuinely cooperative. I think we've got our um, women here, the Merry Wives. They're very cooperative. There's mistresses Paige and Ford over there, the wives, and the older go between gossip, mistress um, quickly, and the young beauty, Anne Page. There is a bit of conflict between the mother and daughter about who is she going to marry. But apart from that, there's a real loyalty among the women. They share their information, they act together, they work as a coalition. Of the men, Justice Shallow has complaints against Falstaff's riotous behaviour. Knight, you've beaten my men, killed my dear, broken open my lodge, to which Falstaff retorts, but not kissed your keeper's daughter. Slender, Shallow's nephew, one of the three possible suitors but not favoured for Anne Page, 
has had his pocket picked by one of Falstaff's men. Even Falstaff's cronies turn against him when he is almost out at heels. Pistol and Nim refuse to carry letters to the wives whom Falstaff plans to seduce to get at the husband's money boxes. When Falstaff throws them out, Pistol revenges himself by going to Ford, the jealous husband, spilling Falstaff's plans. He raises the ugly spectre of cuckoldry, which is one of the insistent themes of the play, symbolised by the horns and the mythical name of Acteon. Ford, disguised as Master Brooke, goes to Falstaff, engaging in false plots to test his own wife's fidelity. Falstaff can't believe his luck. He's going to get paid by Ford to put his plan of seduction of Ford's wife into operation. But the chicanery backfires on both men. Falstaff's made a fool of by the women as a fat old buffoon who couldn't possibly be attractive to them, while Ford is made a fool of for his excessive jealousy and suspicion. I will rather trust a Fleming with my butter, Parson Hugh the Welshman with my cheese, an Irishman with my aqua vitae bottle, or a thief to walk my ambling gelding than my wife with herself. <laughs> Falstaff and Ford are alter, alter egos, and there's an uncertainty running through the play about who is really the cuckold, who wears the horns. At the level of surface morality, of protecting the marriage bond, the play's in denial of what's going on at the structural level. Much as the women protest their outrage at Falstaff's uh, attempts on their virtue, the entire comedy is generated by the women making repeated plots to come back into contact with Falstaff in a series of increasingly dodgy circumstances. At the same time, contact gets disrupted between husband and wife. And it's the jealousy of the husband that's the real threat to the women's well-being, especially Alice Ford. So what are the contacts between Falstaff and the women? First, he writes an identical letter to Alice Ford and Meg Page. The women compare notes and they're outraged to see it's exactly the same, but for the names. I warrant he hath a thousand of these letters writ with blank space for different names. Sure, more, and these are of the second edition. He will press them, uh, he will print them out of doubt, for he cares not what he puts into the press when he would put us to. The chief objection of the women to Falstaff seems to be that he's such a big fat ugly whale rather than moral principles, but anyway they decide to conspire to humiliate the would-be philanderer. Let's consult together against this greasy knight. Now, I'm, I'd like to, my inclination is to read these identical letters as a message from the moon husband, a trickster lunar husband. Um, full stop as the lunar trickster should woo all women with the same message of blood, whether they're rich or poor, whether they're high or low, whether they're younger or older. As Pistol says, he courts all women. I haven't really got enough evidence yet. Do the subsequent meetings between Falstaff and the wives have menstrual lunar character? And I think there's not much doubt they do. So the second assignation, Alice, Alice Ford makes an assignation with Falstaff at her house when her jealous husband's away. Falstaff, in his conspiracy with Ford as Brooke, has given away the information about the meeting to Ford. Meg Page runs in to tell Alice her husband's coming with a whole posse of men from Windsor to expose his wife as unfaithful. The women hide Falstaff in the only place big enough for him, a giant laundry basket, covering him over with piles of dirty linen. Now, a great deal is made of the um, stinking, villainous quality of this linen. And I think it's pretty reasonable to see it as euphemism for menstrual rags. 
The men rush in, the women order servants to carry the big basket to the Thames, leaving the men to search in vain. Falstaff gets thrown into the Thames like a barrow of butcher's offal. He tells Ford as Brooke how he was rammed in with foul shirts and smocks, socks, the rankest compound of villainous smell that ever offended nostril. And he was cooked in this grease. Think of that, a man of my kidney. Think of that, that I'm as subject to heat as butter, a man of continual dissolution and thaw. It was a miracle to escape suffocation. And in the height of this bath, when I was more than half stewed in grease, like a Dutch dish, to be thrown into the Thames and cooled, glowing hot in that surge, like a horseshoe. Think of that, hissing hot. Think of that, Master Brook. So the women cool the, the, the fire of Falstaff's lust. Boito in the opera makes a, a superb drama out of this laundry basket scene because the men come in hunting down Falstaff as the beast. Everyone gets confused because the young lovers, Anne with her preferred lover Fenton, are behind the screens making kissing noises and all the men jump on Fenton thinking that it's Falstaff. Meanwhile, Falstaff is sweltering in the basket right next to the fireplace, getting cooked before he gets soaked. So Boito really plays the fire and the water beautifully. Jealous Ford and his wife confront each other over the dirty linen each side of the giant basket. Foul woman, hell with these rags. So those really are menstrual rags that are separating the husband and wife. So the women are getting the bit between their teeth by now. I know not which pleases me better, says Alice Ford, that my husband is deceived or Sir John. So they decide to pull the trick again, this time making another assignation through quickly. So the third contact, the third assignation, or the second assignation, the third contact, this time Meg runs in to say Ford's coming they can't find a hiding place, there's no escape. So they disguise Falstaff as an old woman, the witch of Brentford, whom Ford hates, he can't stand. Ford comes in and makes the servants empty out the laundry basket, just in case. Meg comes down with the old witch who's been dressed up in this huge gown. So this is nice images of the, the witch um, up there somewhere, is the, the giant witch. Um, and um, Ford flies into a rage. He runs Falstaff as the witch out of the house, beating him black and blue with a cudgel. Okay. Um, mm, I just wanted to pick up a little bit of extra detail on that. Um, so uh, in the logic of the ritual syntax, the sex strike syntax, in the ritual phase, um, as, as I was talking about the gender of power just a, a few weeks ago in respect of, of the Bushman cosmology, each sex during ritual phase, each sex acquires the attributes of the other sex because the signal is wrong sex. To go on sex strike, you're saying no, wrong sex. Um, so this presents gender ambiguity as the key, as an aspect of the ritual phase. Um, so Falstaff's gender, you know, cross-dressing is entirely applicable as this gender of power um, uh, presentation of ritual power, acting as the old witch. So it's a, a, a female, but a ritually empowered female. So f after this scene, uh, from then on, the women start to involve men in their plans. They shame Ford into giving up his stupid jealousy. They say, what, what have you been so jealous of your wife for? And then they together conspire to bring about Falstaff's public downfall in the very last fairy, the fairy scene of the Moonshine Revelry. So this is the, the fourth assignation. Again, it's a promise of meeting Alice, not just Alice, but Meg as well, actually. He's going to be lured to Hearn's Oak in Windsor Great Park at midnight in a disguise as the hunter Hearn with stag's horns and the rattling chain. So we have these uh, various depictions of Falstaff at the oak. 
and he's going to be set upon by the entire company of fairies and elves, hobgoblins and jackanapes. He's going to be pinched and burned, tormented and scared out of his wits until he gives up his wicked philandering ways. And then, of course, Ford gets the opportunity to say, well, now who wears the horns? Okay. Um, all that pinching, this is this lovely, it's, it's not very deep, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, you can go and look at it online, Crookshank's um, painting of the final scene of all the hobgoblins and fairies and, and jackanapes. Um, but it always makes me think with this pinch, with, with the way they describe the pinching and, and prodding of Falstaff, that is extremely similar to when we heard Chris Lowe talking about the experience of stimulation during the healing of the Bushmen, um, which he's gone through these experiences himself, where stimulation of the body is vital in the movement of energy, of the, the um, energy um, to go into trance states. Something of that kind is being referred to in this um, fairy scene, I believe. They are moving into the other world at this oak at midnight. That's what they're doing. But there's a subplot going on, um, which is about the marriage of Anne Page, um, because her parents uh, uh, want her to marry different uh, various suitors. Each one wants her to marry a different suitor, and she wants to marry someone else. She wants to marry Fenton. So what they're trying to do is to make, is to put her in a colour-coded costume whilst um, her supposed marriage partner, the suitor, is also going to be colour-coded and they're going to be somehow married secretly or by kind of... It's, it's kind of strange. But, of course, she outwits them and she elopes with her lover, Fenton. Um, and meanwhile, two little boys are left in the costumes that are supposed to be the codes for the, the bride and the groom to be married. So what we get is a wrong sex marriage at the end of this scene happening as well. So right through to the very end of this play, it's completely anti-marriage. It, it just doesn't work. Marriage doesn't work at all the, the entire time. Um, now, the actual scene at the Oak is rich with ritual, mythical illusions. There's the Oak, the Oak itself with all its, its connotations. Um, there is the uh, motif of the black hunter, Herne the Hunter, horned gods. And there are also references to um, the key symbol, a potent emblem of the English kingship, the garter. And I'm going to tell you more about that. Um, but at the general level, I just want to say that in these contacts between Falstaff and the women, we have the full gender of power logic operating. Wrong sex, wrong species, bloody time, the menstrual lunar time. Um, so he's treated, in these repeated episodes, he's treated as a menstrual rag. He's thrown like dirty linen into the river. He's feminized, but as a witch, richly powerful female. He becomes the hunted beast to be devoured. Okay, so it's like all of the, it's not just one switch or another of the ritual syntax, it's like all of the ritual syntax is being, all the switches are being thrown. And when I worked through that structure in the Falstaff play, I realised that I had seen it all before by seeing it in Lysistrata. Um, and this is the famous comedy by Aristophanes from 5th century of the sex strike, the women collect together uh, the women of Athens, go on sex strike, reach out to the women of Sparta during the Peloponnesian War, which was between Athens and Sparta. Um, and they br eventually bring the men, after a lot of comic interlude uh, episodes, bring the men to peace terms. This was the fantasy of Aristophanes. Um, the points of comparison the episodes, the actual sort of structures of the plays are actually really similar. It's not just vague similarity, it's, it's, it's really strong similarity. Um, Lysistrata represented a tradition of women's rule comedies in Athens. It's, it's one of a number of, 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 of examples. Merry Wives is a kind of mild Elizabethan version of the same sort of thing. 
Um, so just to uh, outline exactly um, you know, the, the similarities, we have this incident which causes women's conspiracy, the women's coalition coming together. The identical letters formulate that in the case of Mary Wives. Um, in the case of the sex strike sisterhood of, of Lysistrata, they go through a ritual over a, where they have a blood sacrifice, which is actually a wine skin, and they all drink red wine with an oath, is how it does. They have this incident of women wetting males. Um, the dirty linen, the, the, the laundry basket in full staff. Um, in the Aristophanes comedy, it is a battle of the men and the women in the chorus where um, women with their water buckets put out the fire of the men in the chorus with their torches. They have exactly the same. There's cross-dressing of the male antagonist, Falstaff is the witch. In, in this estrata, it's the probulos, the magistrate, who comes to remonstrate with the women who have taken over and occupied the Acropolis of Athens. Um, and they dress, they veil him and dress him up and drive him off. So he gets... Um, he, he gets feminized as well. Um, and yes, the, the really interesting, I mean, one of the strong hypotheses that we could derive from looking at that similarity is to say that comedy, it, it, if it's truly comedy, it has to have some kind of combination of these tricks to really be comedy, comedy that has this sort of ritual derivation. Um, but it's only when I looked at Falstaff that it became clear how directly hunting law... So down here, I'm sorry, this may be a bit obscured. Down here, this is the black hunter ritual. So in Falstaff, it's apparent through Hearn the Hunter. His masquerade as Hearn the Hunter. But we also... And this, you know, in this estrata, it's not clear what is the black hunter thing got to do with the women's sex strike. It's not clear at all. Um, so I'm going to say something about that because there really is similarity there. Um, so when I saw Falstaff, it, it became clear how much hunting law and ritual, the Black Hunter right, connects to comedy, carnival and riot. Um, one of the figures who, who most um, obviously links them is Dionysus. Dionysus, the god of the comedy festival at, at Athens the presiding deity, but he had an archaic aspect as Zagreus, who was a hunter. And one of the oldest layers of ritual that was associated with Dionysus was known as Agrionia. And this was very widespread in Greece. The priest of Dionysus would be blackened. He would have a guise of the black hunter. And his job was to chase women away from a sacred precinct women who had been covered in white chalk. So they weren't black at all, they were whitened. Um, and Plutarch, reporting about this Agriona, um, said that the priest literally hunted women down to the point of killing anyone he caught. Now, if we think of the comedy in Merry Wives, the sequence, Falstaff is, as the black hunters, a Hearn the hunter, he's chasing women, or he's trying to catch women, away from the base of the oak. And that's immediately recognisable as, as the same action to anyone familiar with Greek religion as Agrionia. So if we think about the Agrionia lit ritual, it's clearly some form of male appropriation of, rit of female ritual potency. The dark colour is connoting potency of paint or blood associated to hunting, menstruation. And real females have been stripped of that power. They lack ritual potency. They're being driven away on pain of death from a male ritual sacred ground. Okay. Now Dionysus is a, a menstrual lunar deity of enormous antiquity. He's the god of the Minad rioters on the mountains where hunted beasts get torn to pieces. His savage imagery is blood, rawness, incest, transvestism, all the terms of the ritual syntax, the horns, the bull snake, his imagery. But then he's also portrayed as Bacchus, the light-hearted bringer of wine to civilization, with his laughing train of satires. 
And one of the chief companions of Dionysus is Silenus. Um, now I'm sorry, this hasn't read the copy. The old photocopy I had from here didn't photocopy very well. It didn't come up on, uh, on the slide very well. It's better on a transparency. Um, but um, he is, we can see the shape of this is a mask of Silenus from an old Greek, uh, ancient Greek mask. Um, we can see the shape of the crown, this Bacchic crown with grapes up here, the horns, the little horns, and then this great big beard, wavy, sort of flowing river-like beard uh, down there. Um, and Silenus is really a likely ancestor of Falstaff. He's fat, he's pot-bellied, his gross appetites. He was also renowned for craftiness. If you got hold of him, when he was drunk, he could be induced to utter words of wisdom and deep perception. It's again a notion of being entranced and in trance being able to see or perceive. Yeah. So he has his horns, the Bacchic crown. Now this really looks like the, de it looks like the devil. Prince Hal, like a Christian would see it as the devil, but of course it's pre-Christian. Prince Hal calls Falstaff that old white bearded Satan. Just as Silenus and his company were part of the, the revelry in the Attic Komoi, fat, bearded, masked, horned characters acted as the masters of ceremony in the mummers' plays, the English mummers' plays from which Shakespeare's deriving his drama. In particular, there is Beelzebub. Um, Beelzebub could be an old woman, uh, just like Falstaff as the witch. And there is Father Christmas, who's hugely fat, who's red, who wore a red mask with horns. Now, now we associate uh, Father Christmas to reindeer, but mostly in the Mama's play, it would be a bull mask. Okay. Um, Father Christmas officiated in battles between the King of England and the King of France, or between St. George and the Turkish Knight. Now, when one of the adversaries fell, he would have some red ochre in his hand. He would apply it to the groin of the fallen knight, sling him over the shoulder, carrying him to a doctor, who was one of the Mama's Play characters, who would then revive the knight, bring him back from the dead so another battle could be fought. So we have death and rebirth with blood applied to the groin. Okay, so this is a bit menstrual, I'd say. There's a sequence in Henry IV, part one, right at the end on the field of Shrewsbury, where the battle between the, the king, the, the supposed prince who's going to become king, and the rebel, Percy, has been fought. Falstaff, um, he's a, totally cowardly. He's played dead so that he would be safe in the battle. But then he finds Percy, the rebel, the one who led the rebel armies, dead. He's been killed in battle by Prince Hal, Percy and Prince Hal have a ritual battle in the scene. But Falstaff finds him dead. He wounds him in the thigh, picks him up, carries him off over his shoulder to Hal, claiming that he's killed him. So that sequence quite clearly has heritage from the Mama's place. It's very clear. So we're in the territory of these horned gods, which go right back to the Upper Paleolithic, um, Croix-Faire Cave with this masquerade of uh, uh, some shamanic figure with the antlers here, um, tens of thousands of years old. Um, but if I want to find a historic ethnographic example of ritual that governs the hunt, which is also licentious riot, well, I can't do better than point to um, the Bushman Menarchal ritual, the first menstruation ritual, which is known as the Eland bull dance. Um, so, how closely can the action of, of Falstaff and the women in the forest actually be compared to the Eland bull dance, the first menstruation ritual? He says, he claims, he's the fattest stag in the forest, chasing my doe with the black scut. Divide me like a bribe buck, each a haunch. So he's trying to chase two women at once. Okay. 
Um, but he's asking to be eaten by those women, like being divided up as a haunch each. Okay. Um, in this ritual, um, the girl herself is the menarchal girl at the centre, who is supposed to be fat and delicious, like the Eland bull. She's identified through fatness with the bull, which identifies her to the fat of the land and the goodness of, uh, of, of the hunt and the, the land. Meanwhile, the women of the group are dancing around her, imitating having sex, animal sex, with mating with the Elan bull as Elan cows. Okay. Um, so we really have, um, so, you know, there, there, there is something very strong about the link of the hunting, the full stuff as the meat, as the actual animal that's going to be eaten, consumed, um, and this, this luck that's been, the fortune that's being brought to the fat of the land. Okay. Um, Falstaff is also performing a dance of fantasy animal sex with the, the, the Alice and Meg, the, the women. What is the key difference? The key difference between um, the hunter-gatherer rituals, like the monarchical ritual, and what's going on in the comedies is the association with royalty. The menstrual potency that governs hunting, fertility, and the fat of the land in the hunter-gatherer cosmology is going to be co-opted to legitimize kingship, sacred kingship, and Falstaff is intimately bound up in this process. So if we visualize him prowling around the oak at midnight, um, we have a picture extremely similar to James Fraser's famous opening scene in The Golden Bough. I don't know how many of you have had the chance to read it. If you haven't, please do go away and have a look at it. The, uh, that is the scene where the priest king of Arisha, the grove of Diana, the goddess Diana, is prowling around the tree, watching warily for any challenger to his office, because that priest is not just a king, he's a murderer. He murdered the one who was the king before him, and he's going to be murdered in his time. Um, remember Falstaff's phrase about Diana's foresters. It's exactly pointing to, to that. Now, the, the oak, let me just, um, yeah, there's our beautiful oak here. Um, <clears throat> there are various um, beautiful 18th, 19th century prints of this, this oak tree that actually got cut down by um, Mad King George, it was supposed to be. But this was Hearn's oak, reputed to be. Um, Crookshank, Crookshank, who I showed the painting there, um, also had this fantasy view over the Windsor Royal Hunting Forest show, going to Windsor Castle, where um, Henry VIII, the epitome of the Tudor monarch, has a ghostly encounter with a with a Hearn the Hunter galloping across there. Um, now this oak is sacred to Jove, Jupiter or Zeus, especially as a blasted oak that's been struck by lightning. Mistress Page, in her speech, describes how Hearn walks around and about and himself blasts the tree. Falstaff invokes Jove as Jupiter with the legend of how the god, in the guise of a bull, carried off Europe, um, comparing his rampant sexuality with the gods. <laughs> and this story has analogues again with the Bushman stories, the southern Bushman story, of how the rain bull, the rain bull called Qua, carries off a menstrual maiden. So they've all got this idea of the bull carrying off the girl. Um, so can we derive direct line linkages between hunting, royal power, and menstrual potency in The Merry Wives. Um, so let's just hear how Mistress Page recounts the Hearn legend. There is an old tale goes that Hearn the hunter, sometime a keeper here in Windsor Forest, doth all the winter time at still midnight walk round about an oak with great ragged horns 
and there he blasts the tree and takes the cattle and makes milk kine yield blood and shakes a chain in a most hideous and dreadful manner. Okay. Now this, rem this imagery of cattle's milk kine giving blood and the blasting of the, the tree, um, this, this kind of blasting, these descriptions are typical of descriptions of witches and menstrual women in widespread folklore, going right back to um, the, the ancient Greek authors, describing the powers of menstrual women for curdling milk um, and destroying sort of agricultural produce, rendering sterility. Okay. Now, supposedly, Hearn was a hunter of a Plantagenet king, the preceding dynasty, who stood in the way when a white heart, that is a, d a deer, white heart charged his master, the king, and he was wounded um, by the antlers in the thigh. Of course, now the one who bleeds and dies, that is the real indigenous king, okay? But these so-called royals, the Plantagenets, the Tudors, and the Saxe Coburgs, if you want to come up to date, um, these ones are the fakes. <laughs> Okay, they help, they're stealing the menstrual powers from the real sort of indigenous powers. And I'm arguing that these rituals and myths about an auto authentic English tradition were co-opted to enable expansionist warring kings to claim legitimacy as national rulers through powers over fertility, represented by menstruation, and fat of the land, hunting gives these images of the king on his hunting in his forest, the fat of the land. Um, just remember who these Plantagenets and Tudors, they were warring all over the place, warring with France, um, you know, dis despoiling, despoiling their kingdoms with taxes, with you know, ruining the actual subjects by, by spending all this money on their armies. Um, and of course, Shakespeare's chronicle plays are part of the Tudor propaganda for you know, establishing that this is righteous and th this is the proper way that kings should should be conducting themselves. There are also analogies with African central Bantu mythology of tribal kingship, which has been an analyzed in, in beautiful detail by Luc de Hoche. So I, I think there's just no doubt that that is what this mythology is, is trying to do. Um, Christians, uh, if we think of a Christian perspective on, on all this kind of lunarchy going on, they held, they had deep suspicion of such lunarchy with all this masquerading or as horned beasts, um, unless it was exercised by a special royal prerogative. So these are the words of an Archbishop of Canterbury from the seventh, oh, his seventh Archbishop of Canterbury, Theodore, he's not actually the seventh century. Uh, who said, if anyone in the calends of January goes about as a stag or a bull, making himself into a wild animal, dressing in the skin of a herd animal, and putting on the head of beasts, those who in such wise transform themselves into the appearance of the wild animal, penance for three years, for it is devilish. There's no doubt about the Christian attitude here. Hearn comes from a swathe of stories across Europe about the wild hunt, which is usually led by some blasphemous pagan king, um, blasphemous pagan king uh, 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 who's been cursed to hunt forever. That is, he's stuck forever in one mode. If we think of the ritual syntax, waxing and waning, by being forced to hunt forever, He's like stuck in one side of that, that syntax. These stories are not just expressing antagonism of pagan and Christian ritual, but something that's much older. It's an irreconcilable opposition between hunting and farming. And they're described always, these, these hunting monarchs are always described in terms of barrenness, sterility, blasting with lightning, blasting the crops. Hearn's name, in particular, can be connected to Herion, who's a which is a title of Woden, the Norse king of the gods, like Jove, but also Herla, 
who's a British king, the subject of medieval legends of the Wild Hunt. Now, these Germanic names were Latinized um, as Helakini, the people of Helakin, described in visions by monks and priests in northern France, they were, who saw souls in damnation, black and fiery, riding on saddles with red hot nails. The leader of the hunt is Harlequin, the very same who becomes in the Commedia dell'arte, tradition of Latin lands, the fool, the comedy king, the leader of the carnival. So Falstaff is occupying just exactly the same space as Harlequin, both wild huntsmen and carnival king. Now this image, which I don't know the provenance of, but it, it gives an, it, it encapsulates everything perfectly. Um, Harlequin here is disguised in his carnival outfit as the goddess Diana, the goddess of the hunt and the new moon. Um, now in the carnival, uh, he was a gender bender in the carnival where he would have particular reference to women's reproductive processes. He could have false pregnancies, he could breastfeed babies. Okay. So we're really going to get subversive now because I'm going to go to the heart of the symbolism of the English kingship, which, uh, which, is, which really references female sexuality. And the symbol which ties English royal power and menstrual potency together is the garter. And this emblem has a special place in, let me just take that up, a special place in the play, The Merry Wives. First of all, the play was produced for a garter feast where one Lord Hunsdon, who is the patron of Shakespeare's company, was installed as a knight of the garter. Secondly, the garter inn is one of the key settings of the play and it is Falstaff's seat, his stamping ground where he resides. The speech of Mistress Quickly as the fairy queen is a very ludicrous sort of literary conceit about the garter where the flowers are meant to have the motto of the garter written inside them. So it's just Shakespeare sort of showing off and, and toadying up to his aristocratic patrons. So the legend of the garter tells in the reign of Edward III, who's quite an ancestor of these, there's quite a few generations back now, he was dancing with the Countess of Salisbury and her garter fell down. Okay, three guesses about what that garter really represents. Um, the king picks it up and uh, he, he utters this motto, Oniswaki mali pons, that's evil be to him who thinks it. And then the king ties it onto himself. So he's picking up a woman's menstrual rag and putting it on himself. Okay. Um, so here is our English coat of arms. And I'm just looking, I'm just pointing to the generic structure of what's actually the shape of lying there and what, how it's made. So we have the lion opposed to the unicorn, horned beast, okay. Um, and they're rampant around the, the, the garter with this motto. Um, now that shape is what's referred to as vesica piscis, which is a kind of Latin circumlocution. Um, it's an imagery of female potency, or let's say uh, the female gateway between the, other, the, the world inside the womb and the world outside, okay? Um, and it could be seen, understood as Schielenagig. It's the vulva, it's the cunt exposed, spread apart between the thighs. Now, this is something that's absolutely generic worldwide. It's been described, so these are a number of images from all over the world. Um, this is, whoa, which one? This is... Um, Sorry, Quite, that yeah, you will be right. This is this is Canadian Nootka. This is Ecuadorian. This is Papua New Guinea. This is Etruria. Back to sort of classical sources. Um, they all have this what very overt. So we've got the female figure quite overt, exposing genitals and reproductive potency between the two animal figures. They're not always horned beasts, but they may be fierce lions. Mm -hmm monkeys in this case. Um, so the, you know, the, it, the, this is um, 
this is something that's gone all over the world. Um, we can see some more classical examples from of an Artemis type goddess between wild um, beasts here um, with ca horned cattle with um, that is actually the fish so that is actually the Vescapiscus in, in showing its shape there um, now this is so old that it goes all the way back I've shown you these Bushman images when I was talking about the Bushman gender cosmology quite a, a couple of months ago and we really have this tradition of spread leg figures goes all over the place in African rock art. These are very old ancient images um, or the ideas behind them are very, very old. And these, these images have a combination, a sort of double sexing with female sex, male sex, and men this is bright, this is red ochre, menstrual potency um, as, as this. Uh, so, okay, what can we, <laughs> What can we say about this? Um, we, we can also show it, coming back from the Bushmen, we can also show it in a much more similar tradition to the English coat of arms, but I say it's saying the same thing again and again. The, these beautiful, the uh, Damalalikorn tapestries, the Flemish tapestries that are found in Paris, the Musée de Cluny, really go and see them if you have the chance. And we've got, again, lion and unicorn. Unicorn horned beast, okay? Both surrounding um, this fertile sward of wild creatures, little rabbits, hopping about, little rabbits uh, hopping around. Um, and this lunarchic, this red, potent, ritually potent lunarchic lady. Look at all her lunar, her, her, her beautiful lunar emblems with her assistant this is a menstrual hut quite clearly um, so you know the garter in the english coat of arms is placing female reproductive potency basically a big fat cunt central in the english coat of arms so remember that when you're thinking about the royal baby <laughs> next time um, and yeah they might count me off to the tower they've tried calling me off to the tower before so i don't know if they Gonna bother at this stage, but um, yeah, that, you, I bet you didn't know that. Well, now you do. Okay. So our last bit. I'm sorry, I've gone on. No, I haven't gone on that long, has it? We started late. Um, I'm nearly uh, here. An hour and ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. We've got to do it properly. Um, we're the last conundrum of the play. I, I, I hope by now you're convinced. Yeah, the work with the sacred water of the Thai king is menstrual fluids, basically, to render him capable of as if female reproductive potency. Question. Um, these are lunar menstrual cosmologies. But the last, just the last conundrum of this play is, um, you know, what's, it, what's all this stuff about the theme of cuckoldry why is cuckoldry symbolized by the horns? Why the name Acteon? Why is the cuckholder also the cuckold? So Falstaff and Ford seem to change their roles. Why is the mythical hunter turned into the hunting beast, turned into the hunted beast, but identified as the cuckold? Why does possessing the horns, which should be ritual power, think of the trois frères, the Paleolithic imagery, the shaman with the horns is in ritual power. Yeah? So why is that a sign of the cuckold? But I think that sex strike logic, our lunarchy logic, can just easily explain that at, at a stroke. Um, if you just think of your, as yourself as a male going through this cycle of the sex strike, the hunting, the bringing back the kill, the, the, the taboos relax, sex strike again. Just think how that works. So if you, if you go back as a male, you would go back to your kin, your own clan at the dark moon because the women, your wife, is on sex strike. Okay? So your wife stays with her kin at the dark moon. And as with her kin, she's involved in kind of rituals of license which may be incestuous in terms of classificatory kinship. You, therefore, as a husband, you're being cuckolded. But um, you're also portraying the wrong species because you're donning the horns, you're becoming like an Elam bull, 
and you are also cuckolding the husbands of your sisters. So you're both a cuckold and a cuckolder. Okay. You're in ritual power mode. You share the gender of power with your kin. So in a classic moiety system where there's like two clans swapping husbands and wives with each other, we should see reciprocal cuckoldry as marital bonds get broken up. Full stuff in the end of the play decrees and my horns I bequeath to your husbands. So that is the, the ritual logic of the play that on the surface is moralizing about privatized sexual interests of the Christian husbands, but actually pursues the sex strike logic all the way to the end. The last bit is to say that Verdi and Boito um, provide the suitable majestic ending in their very fight. Verdi has this amazing fugal chorus right at the end of the opera, celebrating the world-shaking power of laughter. Their Falstaff is the most ample, all-encompassing. In terms of magico ritual structure, he acts as a lunar trickster, the wild huntsman, Windsor stag, carnival king. All the signals of ritual potency derived from the ancient logic of hunting and fertility by the moon are contained by his mighty stomach womb. Licentious and riotous, he's the common wheel on which all the people live, the whole world as a jest, without annexing his enormity as the aboriginal drunken king. Those Tudor upstarts would remain just that. They would be non-entities. Falstaff, the Lord of Misrule, and his cronies are portrayed as a riotous mob looting and thieving, Diana's foresters. But the truth is, these crowned heads with their secret star chambers have stolen the magic and trickery which right royally belongs to us. <laughs>